With that, we need to now explain how we train these networks. And for training these networks, we need uh, large data sets. Yeah, so the, data, the story of data sets is critical, of course. So far, we've talked only about neural networks, but neural networks only establish an upper bound on your performance. Many of these neural networks, uh, they have hundreds of millions of parameters. And these hundreds of millions of parameters, they have to be set correctly. <laughs> if you have a bad setting of parameters, it's not going to work. So neural networks are just an upper bound. You also need massive data sets to actually train the correct algorithms inside them. Now, in particular, when I joined roughly four years ago, we were working with a third party to obtain a lot of our data sets. Now, unfortunately, we found very quickly that working with a third party to get data sets for something this critical was just not going to cut it. In the spirit of full vertical integration at Tesla, we brought all of the labeling in-house. And so here, for example, I'm showing some of the screenshots of some of the latency throughput and quality statistics that we maintain about all of the labeling workflows. In the beginning, roughly three or four years ago, most of our labeling was in image space. And so you can imagine that this is taking quite some time to annotate an image like this, and this is what it looked like. Uh, where we are sort of drawing polygons and polylines on top, of, um, on top of these single individual images. As I mentioned, we need millions of vector space labels, so this is not going to cut it. Very quickly, we graduated to three-dimensional or four-dimensional labeling, where we are directly labeling in vector space, not in individual images. So here what I'm showing is a clip, and you are seeing a very small reconstruction. You're about to see a lot more reconstructions soon but it's a very small reconstruction of the ground plane on which the car drove and a little bit of the point cloud uh, here that was reconstructed. And what you're seeing here is that the labeler is uh, changing the labels directly in vector space and then we are reprojecting those changes into camera images. Uh, so we're labeling directly in vector space and this gave us a massive increase in throughput for a lot of our labels. And so we're gonna now talk about auto labeling which is some of the infrastructure we've developed. Here's an example of how we label a single clip. A clip is an entity that has dense sensor data, like videos, IMU data, GPS, odometry, et cetera. Uh, this can be 40 per second to a minute long. These can be uploaded by our own engineering cars or from customer cars. We collect these clips and then send them to um, our servers where we run a lot of neural networks offline to produce intermediate results, like segmentation mask, depth, uh, point matching, et cetera. This then goes through a lot of robotics and AI algorithms to produce a final set of labels that can be used to train the networks. One of the first tasks we want to label is the road surface. Typically, we can use splines or meshes to represent the road surface, but those are, uh, because of the topology restrictions, are not differentiable and not uh, amenable to producing this. So what we do instead is in the style of neural radiance fields work from last year, uh, which is quite popular. So we use an implicit representation to represent the road surface. Here, we are querying XY points on the ground and asking for the network to predict the height of the ground surface, along with various semantics such as curves, lane boundaries, road surface, driveable space, etc. So given a single x, y, we get a z. Together, these make a 3D point, and they can be reprojected into all the camera views. Here's an example of how that uh, looks like. So here, this is an optimized road surface that reprojects into the eight cameras that the car has and across all of time. And you can see how it's consistent uh, across both space and time. So a single car driving through some location can sweep out some patch around the trajectory using this technique but we don't have to stop there. So here, we collect, collected different clips uh, from the same location, from different cars maybe, uh, and each of them sweeps out some part of their road. Cool thing is we can bring them all together into a single giant optimization. So here, these 16 different trips are organized uh, using, uh, aligned using various features such as road edges, lane lines, all of them should agree with each other and also agree with all of their image space observations. Together, this, is, this produces an effective way to label the road surface, not just where the car drove, but also in other locations that it hasn't driven yet. Again, the point of this is not to just build HD maps or anything like that. It's only to label the clips through these intersections. So we don't have to maintain them forever, as long as the labels are consistent with the videos that, were, that they were collected at. We don't have to stop at just the road surface. We can also arbitrarily reconstruct 3D static obstacles. Um, here, uh, this is a reconstructed uh, 3D point cloud from our cameras. And the main innovation here is the density of the point cloud. Typically, these points require texture uh, to form associations from one frame to the next frame. But here, we are able to produce these points even on textureless surfaces like the road surface or walls. Uh, and this is really useful to annotate arbitrary obstacles that um, we can see, on the, see in the world. One more cool advantage of doing all of this on, server, on the servers uh, offline is that we have the benefit of hindsight. This is a super useful hack because uh, say in the car, the, net the network needs to produce the velocity. It just has to use the historical information and guess what the velocity is. 
But here, um, we can look at both the history, but also the future, and basically cheat and uh, get the correct answer uh, of the kinematics, like velocity, acceleration, et cetera. One more advantage is that we can have like, different tracks, but we can stitch them together th even through occlusions, because we know the future, we have future tracks, we can match them and then associate them. So here you can see the pedestrians on the other side of the road are persisted even through multiple occlusions by these cars. This is really important for the planner because the planner needs to know if it saw, if it saw someone, it still needs to uh, account for them even then they're occluded. So this is a massive advantage. Combining everything together, we can produce these amazing data sets that annotate um, all of the road texture, all of the static objects, and all of the moving objects, even through occlusions, producing excellent kinematic uh, labels. All, you can see how the cars turn smoothly, produce uh, really smooth labels, all the pedestrians are consistently tracked, uh, the parked cars uh, have basically zero velocity, so we can also know that they are parked. So this is huge for us. This is one more example of the same thing. Um, you can see how everything is consistent. We want to produce a million such uh, labeled uh, clips and then train our video, uh, multicam video networks with such a large data set and really crush this problem. We want to get the same view that's consistent that you're seeing here in the car. We started our first exploration of this with the Remove the Radar project. Um, we removed it in a very sh top, uh, short time span, I think, within three months. Um, in the early days of the network, we noticed, for example, in low visibility conditions, uh, the network can suffer uh, understandably because obviously this truck just dumped a bunch of snow on us and it's really hard to see. But we should still remember that this car was in front of us. But our uh, networks early on did not do this because of the lack of data in such conditions. So what we did, we asked the fleet to produce lots of similar clips. And the fleet responded, it did. It produces lots of video clips where sh falling out of all other vehicles. <laughs> And we sent this through our auto-labeling pipeline that was able to label 10K clips in within a week. This would have taken several months with humans labeling every single clip here. Um, so we did this for 200 uh, different conditions and we were able to very quickly create large data sets and that's how we were able to remove this. So once we train the networks with this data, uh, you can see that it's totally working and keeps the me in memory that this object was there uh, and uh, provides this. In addition to auto-labeling, we also invest heavily in using simulation for labeling our uh, data. So a few things that I wanted to point out, uh, for example, the ground surface. It's not uh, plain asphalt. There are lots of cars and uh, cracks and tar seams. Uh, there's some patchwork done on top of it. Um, vehicles move realistically. The truck is articulated, uh, even goes over the curb and makes a wide turn. Um, the other cars uh, behave smartly. They avoid collisions, go around cars. Uh, and also smooth and accelerate smooth, uh, break and accelerate smoothly. And since this is a simulation, it starts from the vector space. So it has perfect labels. Uh, here we show a few of the labels that we produce. Um, these are vehicle cuboids with kinematics, um, depth, surface normals, segmentation. But um, Andre can name a new task that he wants next week, and we can very quickly produce this because we already have the vector space and we can write the code to produce these labels very, very quickly. So when does simulation help? It helps, number one, when the data is difficult to source. As large as our fleet is, it can still be hard to get some crazy scenes, like this couple and their dog running on the highway while there are other high-speed cars around. Um, this is a pretty rare scene, I'd say, but still can happen, and Autopilot still needs to handle it when it happens. When data is difficult to label, um, there are hundreds of pedestrians crossing the road. This could be a Manhattan, a downtown, people crossing the road. It's gonna take several hours for humans to label this clip. And even for automatic labeling algorithms, this is really hard to get the association right and it can produce like bad velocities. But in simulation, this is trivial because you already have the objects, you just have to like spit out the uh, cuboids and the velocities. And also finally, when we introduce closed loop behavior where the car needs to be in a determined situation or the data depends on the actions, this is pr pretty much the only way to get it uh, reliably. We also have a lot of different locations mapped and created uh, to create these uh, sim environments. We have actually 2,000 miles of uh, uh, road built, and this is almost the length of the uh, roadway from the east coast to the west coast of the United States, which I think is pretty cool. In addition, we have built efficient tooling to build several miles more on a single day on a, for a single artist. But this is just tip of the iceberg. Actually, most of the data that we use to train is created procedurally using algorithms as opposed to artists making these simulation scenarios. Um, so actually, we want to create, uh, recreate any failures that the that happens to the autopilot in simulation so that we can hold autopilot to the same bar from then on. So here, on the left side, you're seeing a real clip that was collected from a car. 
it then goes through our auto-labeling pipeline to produce a 3D reconstruction of the scene along with all the moving objects. With this, combined with the original visual information, we recreate the same scene synthetically and create a simulation scenario entirely out of it. So, and then when we replay autopilot on it, autopilot can do entirely new things and we can form new worlds, new outcomes from the original failure. This is amazing because we really don't want autopilot to fail and when it fails, we want to capture it uh, and keep it uh, to that bar. Not just that, we can actually take the same approach that we said earlier and take it one step further. We can use neural rendering techniques to make it look even more realistic. Um, so we take the original, original video clip, recreate a synthetic uh, simulation from it, and then apply neural rendering techniques on top of it, and it produces this, which looks amazing in my opinion, because this one is very realistic and looks almost like it was captured by the actual cameras. Um, this is a result from last night, <laughs> because this was cool and we wanted to present it. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, I'm very excited for what Sim can achieve. But this is not all bullshit because networks trained in the car already use simulation data. We used 300 million images with almost half a billion labels, and we want to crush down all the tasks that are going to come up for uh, the next several months. With that, I invite Milan to see uh, to explain how we scale these operations and really build a label factory uh, and spit out millions of labels. All right, thanks, Ashok. Hey everyone, I'm Milan. Uh, I'm responsible for the integration of our neural networks in the car and for most of our neural network training and evaluation infrastructure. So I'd like to give you some uh, idea of what it takes to take our neural networks and um, move them in the car. Uh, and so the, the, the two main constraints that we're working on there here um, are mostly latency and frame rate, uh, which are very important for safety, but also to uh, get proper estimates of acceleration and velocity of, of our surroundings. And so the meat of the problem really is around uh, the AI compiler that we write and extend here within the group that essentially maps the compute operations for my PyTorch model uh, to a, a set of dedicated and accelerated uh, 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 pieces of hardware. And we do that while figuring out a schedule that's optimized for throughput uh, while working on their severe SRAM constraints. And so by the way, we're not doing that just on one engine, but on, across two engines on the autopilot computer. And the way we use those engines here at Tesla is such that uh, at any given time, only one of them will actually output control commands to the vehicle, while the other one is used as an extension of compute. But those roles are interchangeable, both at the hardware and software level. So how do we iterate quickly together as a group uh, through this AI, AI development cycles? Well, first, we have been scaling our uh, uh, capacity to evaluate our software and neural network dramatically over the past few years. And today, we're running over a million evaluations per week on any code change uh, that the team is producing. And uh, those evaluations run on over 3,000 actual full cell driving computers that are hooked up together in a dedicated uh, a cluster. And so on top of this, we've been developing really cool uh, debugging tools. And so here is a video of one of our tools, which is uh, helping developers uh, uh, iterate through the development of uh, neural networks and comparing live uh, the outputs from different revisions of a same neural network model as reiterating live through uh, video clips. So last but not least, uh, we've been scaling our uh, neural network training compute dramatically over the past few years. And today we're barely shy of 10,000 GPUs, which just to give you some sense, in terms of number of GPU, uh, is more than the top five publicly known supercomputers in the world. Um, but that's not enough. And My name is Ganesh, and I lead Project Dojo. Our goal is to achieve best AI training performance and support all these larger, more complex models that Andre's team is uh, dreaming of and be power efficient and cost effective at the same time. If I were to plot the IO bandwidth on the vertical scale versus teraflops of compute that is available in the state of the art machine learning chips are there, uh, including some of the startups, you can easily see why our design point excels beyond par. What it is, is a nine petaflop training tile. This becomes our unit of scale for our system. And this is real. Did we stop here? No. <laughs> we have an exapod. This is 
one exaflop of compute in 10 cabinets. It's more than a million training nodes that you saw. We paid meticulous attention to that training node, and there are one million nodes out here. It'll be a fastest AI training computer, 4x the performance at the same cost, 1.3x better performance per watt, that is energy saving, and 5x smaller footprint. And we are not done. We are assembling our first cabinets pretty soon, and we have a whole next generation plan already. We are thinking about 10x more with different aspects that we can do all the way from silicon to the system again. We will have this journey again. We are recruiting heavily for all of these areas. Thank you very much.